Really great to be here, and we're, uh, we're thrilled that the First Lady is coming later today. How about that? Um, and we're thrilled to have all of you here. We got another packed room. Um, we, uh, you know, when we started Project Play um, uh, three years ago, we weren't quite sure where this was going to lead. It just felt like something that was the right thing to do. Um, uh, you know, it started with this book that I, I wrote, uh, where I went around the country and and, and told people how we became the world's sports superpower, but also had the world's worst obesity crisis. Uh, and everybody wanted, um, they said, great, thanks for, thank you for letting us know how we got into this nest and how, we, how do we get out of it. So that's when we partner with the uh, Aspen Institute and uh, really convene this conversation about driving towards solutions that I think the marketplace um, really wants. So we're, uh, again, we're thrilled that uh, Mark was able to step up on short notice today, but I want to uh, I want to introduce a, uh, a Grand Hill reference, or at least a Hill family reference into uh, the morning here, uh, because it's pretty meaningful to me. My career uh, actually started uh, with, with Calvin Hill um, a long time ago. My, my father was a salesman for Xerox, and he was at a conference in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and I got a call from him. Uh, I was in eighth grade, and I'm down in Florida. He's up there. He says, uh, he says, hey, you wanna, you wanna talk to Grant Hill? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Calvin Hill? And I said, yeah. He says, you wanna interview him? I said, okay, but I don't have any questions together, so can he call back in a half hour? <laughs> like I was Walter Cronkite, you know, dictating the terms of engagement or something. Um, but what do you know? He called back in a half hour, and, and Calvin Hill spent Thirty, another 30 minutes with me on the phone. Uh, he was he was sincere and thoughtful and patient and um, and engaged. And it wasn't about him and obviously some opportunity to promote himself. It was about me. It was about investing in um, someone else's kid, uh, and that stuck with me. Um, and I think that ethos of investing in other kids who are not your own, uh, it, it runs through project play here. And I think that is in part why um, all of you have come here today, because you, um, you're not just trying to improve life for, uh, for your own family or for your own kids. You see something, uh, you see a common good uh, that is worth pursuing, and, and you want to be part of a, a solution or a set of solutions um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, so the... Uh, you know, it, it, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's so important for kids to get active through sports. I mean, just yesterday, the National Institutes of Health released a, uh, a study, I don't know if, if many of you saw it, uh, in which they, they, they showed that uh, the leisure time physical activity is associated with lower risk of 13 different types of cancer, from colon to breast, kidney to myeloid leukemia. So, I mean, people, if we, if we really want to stop cancer here, I mean, fine, keep wrapping things in pink. But I think the best thing you could possibly do is start wrapping kids in a layer of sweat uh, at a very early age and giving them the, uh, the healthy habits for life to keep, them, uh, to keep them active. The question is, how well are we doing at giving kids the sport experiences they want and need, all kids, regardless of zip code or ability? Um, what is the state of play for kids in the year 2016? What grade do stakeholders deserve? Leaders from across the eight sectors that touch the lives of children. National sport organizations, community recreation groups, educators, policymakers and civic leaders, tech and media, public health, business and industry, and parents. Uh, because no one sector can do this alone. Project Play recognizes that. No one organization, no one sector can, can figure this out. How do, how do all kids active through sports? Um, so, uh, in terms of how you're doing, uh, let's, let's figure it out right now. Let's, um, please pull out your phone, if you guys have your mobile phones with you. I want you to go to your browser and uh, type in this address. It's up on your screens right now, as.pn uh, backslash pp7. Okay. This is a Microsoft uh, Pulse poll. We're working with Microsoft on this today. Uh, it's, it's experimental. We're going to try it. We're going to see how it works. But we think it's, gonna, it's go, going to work great. Uh, and we're, we're going to use it to capture your feelings, uh, how, you, uh, how you feel about how stakeholders are doing in each of the eight strategies 
uh, in the uh, Project Play report, uh, Sport for All, Play for Life, a playbook to get every kid in the game. Strategies designed to build healthy children so we can build healthy communities. Uh, but first, I want you to, uh, give, um, to, to grade the overall state of play. So please answer this question. What grade do you give stakeholders in getting kids active through sports? A to F, uh, what's it going to be? Um, you'll also be asked which sector you represent, allowing you to see how the voting compares across those eight different sectors that I just, uh, I just talked about. And you'll have about two minutes to vote, at which point we will close the poll. Um, we plan to take your collective grade and uh, plug them into a document that you have in your welcome packets. Uh, our latest report uh, called State of Play 2016, a draft of which was released today, a final version of which we will release in the coming weeks. This is another element that we are adding to the summit this year, an annual report that captures trends and developments in each area of opportunity identified in the Sport for All, Play for Life report. It also reflects the latest sport participation rates for children, courtesy of the Sports and Fitness Industry Association. Tom Cove, uh, is Tom here? There's Tom in the back. Thank you, Tom, for uh, helping us uh, you know, crank the data on that, digging into your database. It's really valuable. You can't, can't manage what you can't measure. And so SFI's data, which is the best that's out there, is, is real important to our whole process here. Um, so tell us what you think. You know, we think tapping into the wisdom of the crowd is a better way to go than Tom Ferry or the Aspen Institute assigning a grade. Um, while we may have created the framework for action, the eight strategies for the eight sectors, we would rather you stand in judgment of yourself. Um, the organizations that control policies, practices, and partnerships in this important space. We at the Aspen Institute are more like, I guess, like shepherds of cats, right? You know, we, we kind of convene people, we identify, uh, the greatest opportunities for progress, we kind of say, okay, that's where the milk is, and people are either going to go there or they're not going to go there. Um, we will engage in a deeper way in select projects that we think will produce scalable or systems level or really meaningful change, and you'll hear about a couple of them uh, near the end of the day. But our primary role is, as I said, convener and catalyst. Jim Whitehead, the CEO of the American College of Sports Medicine, described Project Play as, quote, the aggregator, the unifier, the commons for all honorable institutions that serve children through sports. We basically just smash together leaders, pump big ideas into the bloodstream, then organize the best of them in a manner that promotes innovation and cross-sector collaboration. So let's see what grade you guys gave yourself uh, as, to, as stewards of the collective uh, state of play. Let's see if I can read this here. All right, so 60% uh, C, 9% uh, B, 0 A. Wow, all right. Uh, and then D, 27%, uh, and F is 3%. Uh, okay, so C wins. That's terrific. Um, that doesn't surprise me. I, I, that sounds about right for what I would, uh, uh, you guys see you know, pluses and, and negatives, but uh, certainly a lot of, uh, uh, room for room for growth. I mean, personally, I would give um, an I, an incomplete. Now, I know I'm kind of cheating here. That wasn't an option at all. But you know, this is the uh, host prerogative. We make the rules. That's uh, that's why we're making you wear these kind of shoes here today. Um, uh, I, I actually have seen a lot of progress. And here, let me tell you why. I've seen a lot of progress in, in the past year. Fundamental progress. Key organizations adopting a concept of youth sports consistent with the ethos and strategies of the Sport for All, Play for Life report, which really was developed through two years of roundtables and inputs from 300 different uh, thought leaders. Um, at, a at the launch summit last year, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy um, challenged stakeholder organizations to activate around the framework. And since then, we've seen US soccer mandate small-sided, kid-friendly play at the youth levels and recommended no heading until age 12. I mean, the word mandate is, it, it, youth sport organizations typically don't mandate anything. This is a brand new space that, uh, a ver that uh, US soccer is going into it, an experiment that will be uh, uh, worth watching as, as we move along. We've seen the US Olympic Committee take next steps with its American development model, providing guidance for clubs, coaches, and parents on how to engage children through a developmentally appropriate play. We've seen Major League Baseball launch Play Ball, part of a $30 million initiative to encourage participation in all forms of baseball activities. Wiffle ball, stick ball, just throwing, you know, tossing the ball in the backyard uh, with your friends or your, or your parents. 
It's a response to the travel team culture that has made youth baseball, as Cleveland Indians owner Paul Dolan told me, a country club sport. Um, we've seen Dick's Sporting Goods put faces on kids at risk of being left behind through storytelling, powerful storytelling. It's definitely worth watching if you haven't seen it already. Uh, the new Tribeca, uh, film released at Tribeca uh, just a, a few weeks ago called uh, Keepers of the Game about a girls lacrosse team in upstate New York uh, in a Native American community, the type of community that uh, um, we typically don't talk about uh, when we discuss youth sports in, 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 in this country. Uh, we've seen PE, uh, a key agent for introducing a variety of sports to kids at all, of all levels, gain access to new funding through passage of the new federal education law. Um, another positive de development, we've, last year the U.S. Tennis Association rallied 45 national sport governing bodies to take a shared action around project play, endorsing multi-sport play at least through age 12. It was a response to the trend toward early specialization that asked kids to commit to one sport year-round. Last month, the White House and uh, the First Lady's Let's Move initiative announced an agreement with the USOC and 16 national governing bodies to provide two million beginner athletic programming opportunities throughout the year. Also last month, we, we saw the release of the National Physical Activity Plan with its first recommendations for the sports sector. Access to sport was a key theme. These are all positives. Those actions and many more are noted in our State of Play report that you have with you. Um, Organizations that tell us that project, the, the Project Play Report has been useful in shaping or informing their work include the NBA, USA Hockey, Major League Baseball, the USOC, Nike, ESPN, the NCAA, uh, NBC Sports, USA Football, the USTA, USA Baseball, uh, USA uh, Field Hockey, the LA84 Foundation, Partnership for a Healthier America, and of course the, the President's Council, and congratulations. Uh, Shelly Full, who's at home right now, and Chris Watts uh, on your launch of the new uh, Zero to 60 campaign and the 60th anniversary of the council. But what we haven't seen, at least not yet, is systems change at the community level. In the policies and structures that guide uh, which children get access to sports, which do not, which are told they are athletes and which are not, are told they are not. Youth sport is increasingly dominated by early forming select teams that sort the weak from the strong well before kids grow into their bodies, their minds, and their interests. I felt compelled to hop on that bullet train myself uh, as a father, not wanting my kids to miss out on playing in high school. It's gotten to that. Um, and I can tell you that it's not all bad. The car rides um, with your kids are terrific. You get to actually talk to them a little bit. Uh, the self-esteem that flows from your kids being part of something special. Um, you know, uh, our, the youth sport experience in our home has been good. The question is, can this be delivered to every kid in the U.S.? So it's, it's not limited to a, uh, you know, just the families that have the means uh, to, to afford this. I mean, I'm keenly aware that not every family can, can write a $1,000 or a $2,000 check to a local club. Not every family has two parents to ferry kids, uh, you know, to games that are an hour away. And not every kid wants the pressure uh, that can build up around the ex uh, exercise, the, the expectation that some parents have uh, for a return on investment if they're putting all this time and money into the, uh, into the uh, adventure, uh, the lure, you know, driven by the lure of scholarship, which in turn promotes the myth that, uh, that a child must train seriously in one sport year round from an early age. Last year, as you'll see in the, in the State of Play report, the average number of team sports played by youth ages 6 to 17 fell to 1.89. That's continuing a downward slide over the past six or seven years. I mean, I commend the leaders of the, uh, of the Parks and Recreation Department in Sylvania, Ohio, the town that produced that film you just saw earlier, for redesigning their programs to be more child-centric, more accessible to more lower-income kids. But they and other local providers need help. They're pushing against a youth sports culture that is dysfunctional at best and broken at worst. I see a lot of unfinished business, a landscape of volunteer coaches untrained in the key competencies in working with kids. I see parents who want their child to have a healthy sport experience, but have no idea how to demand quality from their local programs, and no tool to find the full array of programs uh, in their area that might serve their kids' interests. Uh, leagues, media companies, and other sports industry leaders have all expressed interest in growing sport participation in the last year. That's great. Most of them get it now. Kids who 
play sports are far more likely to become fans of the sports and thus consumers of uh, their entertainment products. But will they take the next step and empower parents in the right way? Create that bottom-up demand for quality. Uh, can they provide kids with coaching, the coaching they deserve? Quality online training modules offered for free, maybe with incentives to get certified. Can they develop a mechanism to build more play spaces in underserved communities? Can they work with other sectors to create a national policy uh, for sports, as the NPAP calls for, that emphasizes the importance of sports as a vehicle for promoting and sustaining a physically active population, unquote. Uh, don't underestimate policy, uh, folks, in changing the game. Remember, Title IX was one stroke of the pen, and it opened up uh, an awful lot of opportunities for girls and women in this country at the uh, high school and the college levels. Um, so let me give everyone a little motivation to go out there and figure it out. Here's my little clicker here. There we go. Okay, so each year SFIA uh, captures data on the number of youth, uh, quote, active to a healthy level through sports, meaning those who are engaged in high calorie burning activities a minimum of 151 times during the year. A total of 55 sport and uh, fitness activities qualify, and the list includes the vast majority of popular, popular team sports, plus a few other recreational activities that can prompt uh, you know, a good sweat. Last year, the numbers fell to the lowest, uh, fell to the lowest level since 2008. You can see it's, uh, so for six to 12 year olds, it's, it's down to 26.6% .6 of kids are healthy to an active level. For teenagers, it's also fallen uh, as well. Now that's not good, but let's focus on the opportunity, the benefits if we can reverse the slide. What does the future hold if we can make real progress in the other direction? To help with that, we asked the Global Obesity Prevention Center at Johns Hopkins University to run some projections. I think you'll be pretty excited by this. This here is a map of the US. The darkest states represent the highest rates of youth uh, ages 10 to 17 who are overweight or obese. If we're able to just get half of the kids, remember we're, like, we're at 26, 27% right now, if we're able to get just half of the kids to a healthy to an active level, it's projected that nearly a quarter million fewer kids would be obese or overweight. Here's what would happen if we brought it up to uh, three out of every four kids, three times a week, being active th just three times a week, 30 minutes a day, okay? More than 600,000. Um, and here's what it would be if all of them were at that level. Nearly a million fewer kids obese or o overweight. Now that's a good number, but here's a better one. The amount of direct medical cost savings over the course of their lifetimes, $26 billion. Here's the lifetime economic impact of all those kids getting active, $43 billion. And then here is, uh, and since people live active, uh, active people live lo uh, longer lives, here's how many years of life in aggregate we would save. That's a lot of life, life that we can give kids and better our society as a whole. Now mind you, getting kids active three times a week for 30 minutes is a low ask. The CDC recommends one hour daily. If youth, if youth met the CDC standard, here's the projected impact. Pretty incredible numbers, huh? $57 billion in productivity losses saved, $35 billion in direct medical costs saved, uh, three million fewer overweight and obese kids. And here's the impact on just one city, Baltimore. $100,000 uh, years of life saved. Uh, I mean, so, so my question for you folks, is it, is it worth the effort, what you're doing here uh, in your work? Um, you know, it's, uh, is it worth squaring the pyramid of sports, providing all kids, regardless of zip code or ability, with physical literacy by age 12, with the ability, the confidence, and desire to be active? Is it worth activating around the eight strategies for the eight sectors that touch the lives of children, asking kids what they want, reintroducing free play, encouraging sports sampling, revitalizing in-town leagues, thinking small, meaning being creative with the use of, uh, in, the, in the development of play spaces, designing for development, training all coaches, and emphasizing 
uh, um, the prevention of injuries because safety uh, does need to be part of this conversation too. This is Donovan Hill, a young man I met three years ago uh, in my work as a reporter, and that's his mother, Crystal. Uh, Donovan was paralyzed at age 13, trying to stop a runner with a, with a goal line tackle using a dangerous head down technique he alleges was promoted by his coach. That coach was supposed to be trained through Pop Warner, but wasn't. And Pop Warner later argued in court that it had no obligation to make sure he uh, or any coach is trained. And in January, Pop Warner and the coaches who were sued settled with Don Donovan for several million dollars. Last Friday, less than 12 hours after we announced the First Lady as our featured speaker, I got word that Donovan had died. Yeah, he'd gone to the hospital and uh, to get one of his uh, skin grafts uh, from his pressure sores treated and uh, something went wrong in surgery and uh, his heart failed and, and he was 18 years old. So as a journalist, I have, I have no plans to stop telling the stories uh, like these. I, I really believe there's no progress without truth. And I think stakeholders deserve uh, truth so they can design true solutions. But I hope they figure it out. I hope you figure it out as you move along. As more parents are withholding their children from sports that they are unsure will produce positive health outcomes. That is a drag on participation. So let's be clear. That's Donovan uh, before he past. Um, so let's be clear, Project Play is not a framework uh, for more of the same in youth sports, more untrained coaches, uh, more travel teams. Uh, it's, it's not about taking that model and applying to all the kids who are not being, uh, who are not active right now. It's not, Project Play is not about turning back the clock to a bygone era. Uh, you know, one that we, it's easy to forget, didn't, we didn't make a lot of room for girls uh, or kids with disability uh, back in the day. Um, it's really, it's an aspirational model, an appeal for values-based leadership by those with the ability to improve the game and make it more accessible and more affordable to more kids. Over the next several years, expect to see a corporatization of youth sports. Large companies, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, even billionaires are already getting into the space, aggregating assets and content. This will play out really in two, one of two different ways, I believe, depending on uh, where they perceive the market opportunities to be. They will either try to wring more cash out of the families of the four out of 10 kids who play sports on a regular basis, or they will uh, try to find opportunity as well in engaging kids who are outside of the pyramid, kids that often aren't their own. The one thing we can count on, I can promise you, is, is that kids will want to play. Okay, more than four out of 10 kids want to play on a regular basis in this country. You know, when my youngest son, Kellen, who's in the room here, I don't want to embarrass him and point, point him out right now. When he was just a little guy, he would come downstairs and um, the first words out of his mouth every morning were, young go play, daddy young go play. Young go play means, do you want to go play in, in toddler speak? <laughs> and so we, off we would go. We'd go up to the toy room and we'd turn the couch into a, a pretend uh, end zone and, you know, uh, or we, where we'd do, shoot little mini hoops where we'd go outside and kick in the backyard. Um, you know, as, as Maria Montessori uh, observed, play is the work of, of the child. Um, and and so, so, so for us as stakeholders, we need to kind of keep that in mind, I believe, as we move forward because um, it's a lot of times just not getting in the way of the natural instinct of the child, creating a sports system that, that will, uh, uh, where we listen to what they want and they need, and then design activity that will engage uh, a far number, greater number of, uh, of, uh, of kids in, than are currently involved in the system. So do you want to go play? I mean, it is a, uh, I think these are words that we can build the health of the nation on, and uh, maybe even the, a few uh, businesses if that's uh, the incentive we need to uh, 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 make it happen. So I want to leave you with that thought. Um, we're going to uh, uh, leave the live stream right now. Thank you for joining us. We'll be coming back at, um, at uh, for the 1120 for the conversation with Billie Jean King, and followed by the, uh, by the First Lady and Craig Robinson and uh, my colleague at ESPN, uh, Mike Wilbon. Very excited about that. So we'll see you back then. and. Uh, and uh, also, Tom, do you think we need some play this morning? Uh, absolutely, Tim. What do you have in mind? I don't know. I'm an Olympic fencer, so uh, why don't we get some fencing going on? <laughs> Done. Tom, we'll, have we'll... you ever fenced before? Uh, no. 
So uh, one of the things of Project Play is sports sampling. So uh, I think uh, I think you should sample some fencing this morning. All right. Man. Who wants to see Tom fence? <laughs> So uh, I run a foundation called Fencing in the Schools, and we bring fencing programs to PE and after school programs around the country. And uh, the only thing with fencing is you need an opponent. So uh, I happen to know a very good fencer slash general uh, who said he would be willing to, uh, to take you on. So uh, can we bring up the general right now? And uh, you want to keep your glasses on? Uh, no. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to have two rules this morning. One, we don't want you guys to fall off the stage, so we're not going to have you move too much. All right, where's our general? Come on down, Joe. Round of applause for the general. Don't kill me, general. Okay. All right, come on to the stage. We'll, we'll get you guys on stage. On stage, okay. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a few moves first. So, Tom, you're going to come down here. So these are actually some foils that we use to introduce fencing uh, to the kids. Very simple. So in fencing, you score by turning the light on. So that's what these foils do. That's what we try to do for kids as well, is turn the light on using the sport of fencing. Are you a righty? Righty. Take that. Mm -hmm. Are you a righty? I'm an either way. All right, so you're going to go back down this way a little bit. We've got a tight space, but we'll make it work. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is on guard. Well, you got you to oh, face sorry. Tom this way. All right, so check this out, guys. You're going to hold oh, up your oh, foil. Oh, There's not no honor. you got to have honor, General. you got to have some honor. Hold on, hold on. Let's make sure your light's on. No honor with journalists. So let's have you get on guard. Tom, you come over here. You come over here. Yeah. Before you go, Why? you get on guard. OK. So face him like this. Good. This is on guard, OK? And you're only going to take a few steps. So retreat. Your back leg first moves first. Good. Let me see a retreat, General. Only one retreat, so don't go off the stage. And then when we lunge, our arm comes out, and we extend forward. So lunge, recover. Lunge, recover. We're going to do one practice, okay. and then we'll do a real thing. So you're going to be a target for him for a second. Tom, you're going to go towards him, and when you reach him, you're going to lunge and turn the light on the target. We don't want to see this. OK? okay. One, one thrust. One thrust. Here we go. What about the Johnny Depp? That doesn't right. work. That doesn't work either. All right. All right. And go. Well, we don't want that, but that's all right. That's all right. So that's, that's a miss. Every time you do this, technically, you're missing. So oh. as you move, you want to keep your elbow here and just give him one thrust. So one. Do that one more time. Do that one more time. From here. Yes, but you make steps. Move your feet. Get closer. Get closer. Good job. Good job. Uh, all right, now the general is going to use you as target practice okay. with the foil. With yeah, the foil. And point towards him. Point towards him, general. And go. Oh, you're not supposed to block. You're supposed to help him. Help him first. General, let him. There we go. There we go. All right. You guys are going to help me. Whoever hits first is going to get the point. OK? In fencing, before we start, we say on guard. Can I get an on guard? On guard. I need a better on guard than that. Can I get an on guard? On guard. When I bring this foil down, you guys are going to say fence. Fence. They're going to go at it. I'm going to duck, because I don't know what this is going to happen up here. <laughs> Whoever gets a light on first is going to get the point. Oh, OK? Wow. All right, here we go. So let me get a big on guard. On guard. Don't take more than two steps back. Falling off the stage is an automatic loss, OK? okay. So here we go. Right. And when I bring the foil down, let me get a, get a big fence. Here we go. And yes. here we go. Tom's going forward. Let's see who's going to score. <laughs> oh, not yet. Almost, almost. Someone's going to score here. <laughs> This is really great technique, guys. Oh, it was a tie. We have to do one more point. One more point. One more point. This is for the honor of the Aspen Institute, OK? We've got to okay, do this. Here we go. Right. Can I do this one? If, if you want. I don't know if it's going to work, though. All right, all right. Here we go. On guard. Everyone big on guard? On guard. By the way, who's rooting for the general here? Let me hear it for the general. Let me hear it for Tom. That was okay. so enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me hear from the general. Come on, let me hear from the general. And what about Tom? He works for ESPN. Come on, he's running Aspen Institute. All right, here we go. On guard and here we go. Will we have a winner? Someone will survive. Oh, Tom wins. Win. Round of applause for Tom Perry, our fencing champ. All right, so guys, in fencing, we have a lot of honor, so we salute each other. We do like one of these. We salute the crowd, and you always salute your coach. That's me. Good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Round of applause for these guys right here. Great, Thank you, Great job, much. guys. We need a picture real quick All right, before good. we go anywhere. Hold on. You guys can take off your mask so we know who you are for the picture. Can you hold it? You want to let it on? All right. Tom, mask up there. 
You gotta look. Yeah, look that way, Tom. <laughs> what what a great sport. Awesome. Thank you guys. Hope you guys Appreciate had fun. It. Thanks, Tim. Have a good break. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> and general, if anyone gets out of line later, you've got the foil. Uh, what's Thank it? you. Um, I said, if anyone gets out of line later, you got you've got the foil <laughs> at your disposal. Really good. That was really good. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Got it all in. So Mark, are you up now?